I started getting into this stuff. So that's really part of what the talk's about is understanding the play elements, having a, we'll have a look at what the pre-salt looks like and what are some of the things that are indicative of this play and some of the things that say it's probably not there. And then maybe suggest some other places in the world where this play might exist. So with that, this is kind of the stuff that's out there on the World Wide Web that you can download to see what the play looks like. And this is from the USGS, redone by Wood McKenzie. And basically what we're looking at here is a conjugate section from Brazil to Kwanzaa. So basically from here up to here. And the pre salt play sits within this SAG basin, which the SAG is the thermal relaxation, the substance that occurs after active rifting. And that's not entirely true because you do still get some uh, transient rifting after the SAG basin starts. But finally, Petrobras decided to drill through the salt to test these basins. And the way that happened was also a bit of a story. And, and at the time that the pre-salt was discovered, the Santos Basin was kind of uh, the go pasture, the dog patch for Brazil, because everyone knew the best stuff was in the Campos Basin, the deep water play that sits above the salt. And finally, the exploration manager in, in uh, Petrobras, he had a budget, he had to use it, so he decided that they would drill through the salt and test this deeper play. The play had actually already been discovered in the campos where they were producing from uh, freshwater coquinas, but they drilled a lot of wells in this play and it had been hit or miss. But once they started drilling these pre-salt wells in Brazil, it was like Every time they drilled an exploration well, they made a discovery. And so Tupi is like greater than 50 billion barrel discovery. And the reservoir is dominantly this microbialite. And when, when the first wells got drilled, and I asked the, the guys who were watching the drill, and I said, well, what's a reservoir? And they said, microbialite. And I thought, what? what's that? You know, and so, it's actually more or less something like a stromatolite, but a little more complex, and we'll talk a little more about that. So the key elements of this are, this is the, basically a lactin salt, so that's your subsalt play, and this play sits below the atoxin salt. So actually, this is salt, and all of this is actually salt as well in the Santos Basin, because it has a lot of lacustrine sediments intercalated with the original salt. So, boy, these slides don't really look like the color's coming up very well. Uh, this is a slide that I've taken from Jackson 2005 to show where the salt basins are. We've had pre-salt discoveries in Angola and Brazil. So the question is, where in the world do we have other pre-salt potential? and how would we recognize it? And I think that's the first step, is, is to take a look at Angola and Brazil and, and identify the things that we can use to get us started in a new basin, whether it's in Nova Scotia, Greenland, or somewhere like that. And so the salt pre-salt play, the seal, is this salt seal that sits above the whole system. And Really what you're looking at is a system that's sequestered from marine influence. Hence the little bathtub that I've drawn there. Because you're looking at a lacustrine source rock, the Lagoa Feia, that is a major source rock for Brazil and its equivalent in Angola. And then right below the salt, we have these carbonate reservoirs. When we're first looking at this pledge in at Shell, I had the idea that it was going to be like a bone, which is the gamma sand. But if you really thought about it, 
and you had this progression from freshwater lacustrine to salt, you started thinking about what happened just below the salt. What would the environment of deposition be? And one of those potential environments was the one that works, which is you get into a really saline, alkaline system just before the sediment fill starts filling up with salt. So where else in the world can we find this? <clears throat> so a couple of key points. These rifted margins that we're going to talk about show a progression from volcanic to non-volcanic. And this is a kind of way of describing the types of rifts that we see. And we'll go through this idea of volcanic and non-volcanic rifts. Because it's actually important to being able to identify the play. And then there's an outer continental high on the basins that have worked so far, like the Campos and the Santos and the Kwanzaa Basin. And this high sequestered the basin, the original salt basin and sag basins, from marine influence. And that was pretty important because the system that you're looking at, that petroleum system, starts with lacustrine shales as a source rock. And that's what's working to put all that oil in these giant oil fields. Brazil, for many years running, was finding the biggest number of discoveries, huge discoveries, repeated one after another. And the pre-salt basin out or high, it's got to be something special, and it is. It's volcanically modified near the ocean continent boundary. So what I believe is that this outer high has been isostatically elevated throughout the deposition of the Sag Basin, the Sag Basin microbialite reservoirs, and possibly even the salt. So I'm kind of an outlier because I think the salt in Brazil is largely lacustrine in origin. So the other thing is there's a lot of talk about mantle exhumation and I'm going to tell you that it's not fully developed within the South Atlantic. And in fact, if you see mantle exhumation, exhumed mantle, you're probably not looking at a pre-salt play. So I've got these diagnostic pre-salt play elements. One is an hour high that's isostatically elevated to a lacustrine environment, right? Because you are dealing with lacustrine source rocks and lacustrine carbonates. And so you can't have a lot of marine influence. I mentioned the thermal sag basin. The other thing we see is that typically the pre-salt basins have significant extension. And the seaward dipping reflectors, SDRs, are either not present or they're minor in extent. And as I said before, you don't see exhumed mantle. So that'll be the keys to the talk itself. But before I get much further, I wanted to define some of these terms. For those of you who haven't read all the papers that Katya made me read. So this idea of a volcanic margin or volcanic passive margin. The thing that you see on this is you see, and it's unfortunately not showing up well in this projector, but you see these seaward dipping reflectors or SDRs. And in this area here, these uh, SDRs are thought to be subaerial or at least in very shallow water. So when you see extensive SDRs, we're in a volcanic margin, which is different to the margins that we see producing pre-salt plays. So in fact, a volcanic margin is a contraindication. And then what I'm going to call the kind of middle ground is a magma pore margin. And as I said, SDRs are not well developed. And in this slide, you can see an alloctonous salt tongue. And that's going to be the outer continental high that is basically pinning here this rising salt. And so that Brazil margin has this isostatic high that's sat high enough to develop these lacustrine systems. And then there's this new idea about exhumed mantle. 
what is called the zone of exhumed continental mantle. This is an end member. So this would be the end member for the non-volcanic margin, where this would be the end member for the volcanic margins. And just in a cartoon fashion, what happens is you get enough extension that along this detachment fault, you expose uh, lithospheric mantle at the sea floor before you go to oceanic crust. So that's kind of a, a, a little bit of a snapshot of how this is looking. But what I've seen in the areas where we have free salt is that we don't actually see any mantle exhumation. So if I'm looking around the world for other pre-salt margins and I see something that looks like this, I'm not encouraged about the chances of developing a pre-salt play. So hyperextended crust, what's that? That's uh, basically a definition that applies to when you get so much extension that you lose this layer of lower ductal crust which is kind of like a, a shear zone. You know, it'd be, if exposed at the surface, it'd be a myelinitic zone that sits just above the moho itself. And here I've got a diagram that sort of shows where this lower ductal crust would be. So the top of that is a transition between rigid, uh, rigid faulting down into an area of detachment in this lower ductal crust. And then shown here is what some people call the high velocity zone or volcanic addition. This has also been called magmatic underplating. And so what we see here is we see an area where we see magma modifying the outer edge of the continental margin and maintaining this outer margin as an isostatic high. And I mentioned this outer continental margin high which is going to sit here and it's going to act as sort of the boundary between these lacustrine sag basins and anything with marine influence. <coughs> and just a quick note about isostasy. What you'll see in some of the literature by people is they'll put exhumed mantle, this ZECM, right adjacent to riff fill, and in some cases even salt. But we know that the mantle itself is going to sit between three to four kilometers below sea level. So right away we, they've got a problem with their stratigraphy if this zone of exhumed mantle along this detachment fault exists. You can't juxtapose that with shallow water carbonates. It's like, okay, well, they've come up with a lot of ideas on how that might happen, but this, to me, the simplest solution is, well, yeah, it's got to be a deep water indicator. And the same thing for oceanic crust, two to three kilometers water depth, right? So just like the iceberg, everything's floating on the mantle. And basically, it floats to the level of deep water and deep water again. So that's an important concept when you start looking at some of the models that might apply to the South Atlantic. And I think, well, your model should not have to break rules for it to work. So this is kind of the diagnostic features of the pre-salt play. And as I've been saying, the pre-salt play is linked to riff genesis and margin type. Remember, we had those three margins, volcanic, magma poor and non-volcanic. So we need to be in the magma poor, poor or essentially between the two end members, volcanic and non-volcanic. And this pre-salt play occurs in basins, sequestered lacustrine basins where we don't see a lot of marine influence. And the indications for a pre-salt, if we're going to go to Nova Scotia and look at it, are going to be the occurrence of this basin bounding at our high, the occurrence of non-marine salt basins and salt, a thermal sag sequence. And the contraindications are going to be extensive F SDRs and, as I've said, exhumed mantle. 
Boy, this color isn't really quite right on this uh, projector. Or we'll make do. So, that's supposed to be pink, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you're kind of, this, these are going to be the salt basins for the Kwanzaa, the Santos and Campos basins here. And then what you see immediately south of the Santos is the volcanic margin, the Pelotas Basin with SDRs, these seaward dipping reflectors that sit in this position here. And at the margin, the southern margin of the Santos, which is a magma poor margin, we see this underplating or high velocity zone just above the Moho at the edge of this. So we know we have the potential for an isostatic high. We see the same thing at the southern edge of the Kwanzaa. And again, we're looking at basins in the Kwanzaa and the Santos where we've had relatively large amounts of extension. Whereas when you look at the Pelotus or the Namibian margin, you see very little extension and you never really develop this lacustrine sag setting. In fact, Marcio Mello, who many of you may know, got very rich drilling dry holes in Namibia, claiming to be looking for another pre-salt play. Uh, I'm glad he made a lot of money. He's a good guy. All right, so next let's take a look at a seismic section that goes between the Santos and the Kwanzaa Basin. So we just kind of welded these two seismic sections together. And so here's the Espiritu Santo Basin. This section sits right about in here. So that's going to be the Campos Basin and the Kwanzaa Basin with the Santos to the south. <coughs> and what we see, poorly seen on this seismic line, and on this one, but you can see this Alachlan assault rise here and then the Alachlan assault rise at this point here. So there's this outer high that sits at the edge of the Kwanzaa and the Espiritu Santo Basin. And the way this is a, a restoration by Scott Frazier, if the colors was right, you'd be able to see that that says volcanic addition. So essentially the idea is that you have an upper plate and a lower plate just prior to rifting. And the rifting is going to take place along this major detachment. And so it's going to develop an isostatic high that's going to come apart and keep this outer edge high and this outer edge high and then develop these sequestered basins. And so this uh, magma, cha magma chamber or volcanic addition that sits here is either due to decompression melting because we don't have enough continental rock sitting on top of it, or as Scott uh, Fraser suggested, it was caused by flow of this lower ductal crust into this uh, zone where we'd have lower pressure and high temperature. So I'm not so fussed about what the actual origin of it is because I'm looking observationally at where I think I'm going to have these highs that are going to keep the basin sequestered and create a pre-salt play. So we just finished looking at these two lines and I believe that I went the wrong direction. So. Uh, this is supposed to be orange, but we'll make do. <coughs> Fortunately, the salt shows up pretty well in this. And so there are two competing models. The model I'm going to present to you, which has an outer continental high that's remained isostatically elevated, that sets up this sag basin with the Kestrin source and actually sets up eventually the salt with an allotment of salt rise on either side of this continental high. So this is going to be the underplating or volcanic addition that sits at the edge. And then eventually this goes to oceanic crust. But by the time this oceanic crust has occurred, we've already transgressed this entire system with marine carbonates. And I'll show you that in a subsequent slide on the stratigraphy. But if you look at this exhumed mantle model, Essentially what they are doing is they're putting a zoomed mantle juxtaposed to lacustrine source rocks 
and in some cases near, juxtaposed to the salt itself. So here I've got a problem with isostasy because I think, well, this point here should be three to four kilometers below sea level, yet they've got lacustrine and source rocks juxtaposed to this uh, exhumed mantle. So for me, when I see anything that suggests there's exhumed mantle, that's going to tell me, uh-uh, play's not going to be there. And that'll be important to us when we think about places like the Gulf of Mexico or Nova Scotia. Well, and there I did it again, went the wrong direction. Okay, so uh, strat column's a little blue here, uh, but essentially we're looking at Neocomian rifting starting about 135 million years ago and secession of that rifting in around 120 to 115 million years ago. And so we get early freshwater uh, clastic rift fill that later as the rifts fill up we go into a lacustrine coquina section and then into our evaporite carbonates in evaporitic salt deposition, terminating in about 120 million years, and then we see a flood of marine carbonates after salt deposition. And I did it again, wrong one. All right, here we go. So this is kind of a snapshot of these ideas that I've been talking about. So we have the big lake systems, the the Campos Basin, the Santos Basin, and the Kwanzaa Basin. And to the south, we have an open marine seaway. We know that because Hedro drilled a well here in northern Namibia, actually a series of wells, that penetrated no salt and no lacustrine uh, source rock of any significance, and they found a lot of marine sediments. So that outer high isostatically elevated to give us, this is uh, Death Valley just as a conceptual model, essentially is preventing marine transgressions from coming up and polluting our lacustrine system with marine seawater. And so we've got a lacustrine source, and then we have these lacustrine reservoirs with the salt on top as a seal. So just as a sense of what this looked like in the Aptian, Basically, you're breaking up, but you haven't yet breached this barrier to eventually flood in with marine sediments. I'll get this right. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I've got to look at this a second because the colors are all washed out, but that works all right. So basically, the thing that I see in this section is a geochemical stratigraphy in the Lagoa Fea. And that stratigraphy is dominated by lake chemistry from a deeper freshwater lake to as its shallows to a highly saline, highly alkaline playa lake. And probably at the time that these microbialite reservoirs were deposited, the lake looks something like uh, the lakes in Ethiopia, which are super saline and alkaline, and you can see they were shallow enough that camels could walk across them. So basically, the lake was probably somewhere up to here. You know, we're looking at very shallow playa lakes. And what we see is we see this change from freshwater. We have freshwater coquinas and freshwater ostracods, and then we lose all those ostracods and begin to see evidence of highly saline and highly alkaline deposition, which is the mediator, or that's what makes these microbialites precipitate into these carbonates, or what some people have called stromatolites. Not probably really true stromatolites in the way we might think, but certainly they are stromatolites in their makeup because it is microbial uh, organisms that are probably precipitating the calcium carbonate that eventually leads to this uh, reservoir. So if we look at this picture from the Campos Basin, we've got our early rift fill and sag fill, which is the source. Then we have a, a layer of coquinas, which is the deeper reservoir, and then this microbialite reservoir topped off with salt 
and then eventually this whole system is transgressed by shallow water marine carbonates. So just to give a sense of what that depositional environment looked like, you're looking at on these highs, these bounce reefs or stromatolites with oncolites and other debris being shed off of this to the margin of these highs. And up here on the continental margin, you see some evidence of stromatolites, but for the most part, it's more of a Sopka environment. So the environment that we're targeting for the pre-salt are really these highs so long as they're not too high and above the lake level, which happened probably to Conoco Phillips when they drilled their wells. But you wanted to be in this sweet spot where you're looking at the shallow lake and it's hypersaline and hyperalkaline. And so given a picture of this, we have our coquina reservoirs that are in the lower part of the section. And then as it gets more alkaline and saline, we begin seeing these stromatolites. So Petrobras has published these pictures of stromatolites that occur in the microbial reservoir. But when you go to the Campos Basin, what we see are these things that they call brushy stromatolites. And so essentially, these are stromatolites that are about the size of our thumbs. And these types of stromatolites generally occur when we see higher clastic influence versus the low clastic influence of the Santos Basin things. And you think about the Santos Basin, it's like the size of Lake Superior or something like that. So being far away from that clastic source, we develop some of these classic stromatolytic type structures. We see similarities to these things in Wyoming. So in Wyoming, there's a 1,600 square kilometer deposition of these stromatolites. Uh, this was a paper by Ron Surdam, and what we see, and unfortunately uh, this is supposed to be pink, and that's blue. So we see fresh water changing over to saline alkaline systems where we see the stromatolites, and then a reversal, another cycle that goes from fresh water to hypersaline to another uh, stromatolytic layer. And so you see this in the Campos Basin, and we also see it in the Santos Basin, where there's actually more than one cycle of these microbialites. And as shown in Wyoming, these microbialites can cover huge areas in a, in a lake system. The other model for these microbialites is that they're actually inorganic. And so the idea is that these are like the tufas that are found in Mono Lake and Pyramid Lake, California, where the water is so saline and so alkaline that these things are just precipitating out of the lake itself without any uh, biologic mediation. And really what I believe, and I haven't actually had a chance to map this out, so it's somewhat conceptual, is that this volcanic addition and the lower ductile crust, the lower ductile crust itself inhibits the flow of hydrothermal fluids, whereas here in the areas of volcanic additions, we're in a setting where our faults are detaching close to the mantle and are going to be a source for hydrothermal fluids and maybe areas where we see buildups of these microbialites. But my opinion is, is that the microbialites are dominantly uh, biologic in origin, but we do see important areas where hydrothermal fluids pl play a role. <coughs> so when I'm chopping for other places to look for pre-salt plays, I want to I classify the margins. So this is a good example of a non-volcanic margin from Norway where essentially the detachment has led to exhumed mantle outboard of this uh, Jala Ridge that is, some people have called an outer high. But the thing about Nor Norway is you have a sag basin, but it's a marine sag basin because this was never an isostatically competent barrier to the marine influx. When we look at the pre-salt basin in the Kwanzaa Basin, 
we see a sag phase above this rifting, and then we see a salt phase that terminates this overall uh, lacustrine sedimentation that is pinned or stops at the edge of this continental outer high. So any salt that goes past that outer high is all alochthonous. And that's our magma pore margin with this magmatic underplating or volcanic addition. And when we look at Namibia, oh, I wish this projector was doing a better job. <coughs> uh, when we look at Namibia, basically one of the things we see on a volcanic margin is we see extensive SDRs and we see very little actual lacustrine sedimentation. So we're losing our colors, but in Namibia you really only get lacustrine sedimentation up near the rift shoulder in very small, uh, low accommodation space rifts. So I kind of talked about some of the indications for this pre-salt play, that we should have an outer high, and I'll talk about this salt ascension zone as we see it in the Espiritu Santo, Kwanzaa, and Southern Santos. And then the other indication is sag geometries, and this is a requirement for the pre-salt play. We're looking at a play that stands on lacustrine source rocks and lacustrine carbonates. And we'll see that it's not by itself something that we can use to identify a pre-salt play, but it's part of the overall play itself. And then I'll talk later about contraindications. All right. Okay, so these are supposed to be in different colors. Um, so this sits here in the Espiritu Santo Basin. There's going to be the Campo Santos and Kwanzaa Basin. And what we see, this is going to be this line here from the 3D survey, is we see a lock and a salt. And, and a lock and a salt rise outboard, or I'm sorry, inboard of this outer continental high. And when you do a restoration of this, unfortunately you can't see the salt because it turned it white, the edge of the salt is going to come right up to the margin of this outer high. So then with you know, transpression and a lot of other things that have reorganized the systems and sediment loading, we basically cause an uh, assault, an lock and assault rise at the edge of this outer high. So we know that this is the bathtub that sets up this protected lake basin. So when we go to the next slide, this is looking at the slide just adjacent to the one we we're looking at. And this is from the Espiritu Santo Basin, and we're looking at typical rift fault geometries, and very often what you see is you see a dip reversal just before the outer high in the fault geometries, and you see this volcanic addition. So when I'm thinking about exploring for pre-salt in other places like Nova Scotia or Morocco, I'm going to count on the ion lines or lines similar to it, which have these really long offsets and deep record lengths to be able to help me identify the moho where it is and hopefully identify where we see these volcanic additions. So it's going to be important to be able to see that and also to recognize where we see an outer high with an alochthonous salt ascension zone. Oh, Dale, I'm glad that the colors aren't showing up on this uh, gravity map because I was afraid you'd ask some hard questions. <laughs> uh, so essentially, we're looking now at the conjugate section to the Spirit of Santo, and what we're going to see is there's actually a gravity high that corresponds to this outer margin high that's been isostatically high throughout the duration of pre-salt sedimentation. And I'll zoom in on that on the next slide. And what we see is we see that we had a autochthonous of salt all the way up to this point. And then salt gravity dynamics have pushed this out. And we have a large alochthonous salt tone that sits here. So what I've done is I've zoomed in onto this area of this particular slide. This is actually uh, uh, 
instantaneous reflection data that we're looking at here. And you can see, not well on the slide as it's projected, but you can see a base salt that basically terminates at the edge of this basement step. And if the colors were good, you'd be able to see it on this uh, zoom in of the reflection data. So you'll just have to take my word for it that that's going to be the edge of the Lacustrine Basin. And then we can image this deeper uh, magmatic underplating. I know what it is. This is the left-handed mouse. <coughs> if we look then at this southern margin, which is actually going to be the margin that separates these big lacustrine systems from the Aptian Seaway, what we see is we see thinner salt here along the edge, but we see it pinned at the edge of this outer continental high that sits here. And then we see very good evidence for this volcanic addition which are these bright reflectors that we see right here. So essentially the extent of this volcanic addition sits in here and we see volcanic modification of the continental rocks that sit at the edge of this outer high. And I'm hoping we'll be able to see that when we look at the Santos. So we've looked at indications for the outer high. Next what I'll do is take a look at the SAG geometries that we are going to look for when we look for this pre-salt play. So this is the classic steer head sag basin geometry as described by White and McKinsey in the late 80s for the North Sea. And basically we're looking at a active marine sag because we again did not have this underplating that kept this high elevated and it allowed for marine influence throughout the timing of the Sag Basin itself. Not that that was a bad thing because you've got great source rocks in the Sag Basin, but it's not necessarily conducive to identifying a pre-salt play. If we look at the uh, Sag Basin in the Santos, what we see is we see this kind of classic geometry, this steer, steer head geometry it's not quite as classic here because there's been a lot of reactivation of this faulting. But this is going to be the petroleum system that we're looking at. We're going to have salt as a seal and within these reflectors we're going to see stacked microbialite reservoirs. And then we're going to see within this upper part these freshwater coquina reservoirs and within the deeper area are source water. So it's a nice neat little package putting these three things together. So let's talk about contraindications, right? So when I talk about SDRs in a volcanic margin, I mean something like the Pelotas Basin, and it is shot full of SDRs. You still see SDRs on some of the basins like uh, the edge of the Campos and Santos, but Nothing like this. They're really minor bits of SDRs. And I know there's been some published papers that try to make, make out that this whole margin here is covered up with SDRs, but it's not. But the Pelotas Basin is a classic example of this. And we zoom in to the top of the Pelotas, that's the accommodation space that sits in there. And there's definitely not room for a pre-salt play, a little over the Western source rock system. So, stepping from Pelotas over to Namibia, and this is a slide that I took from uh, uh, Marcio Mello, his publication. Basically, we see a series of extensive SDRs that are dipping in this direction here. And on my poorly colored slide, you can see this illustrated. So you get extensive SDRs in the system, and you don't really get any accommodation space in the area where we would be looking for a SAG basin. As I said before, we only see a little bit of a SAG uh, roof fill, the customer roof fill, right there at the rift bounding margin. So 
essentially when we start seeing these SDRs, that's a really good clue that we're not going to find salt basin. I see Shaker is yawning, so I better pick it up. All right, so when, when I looked at this Norse Kedro well, Norse Kedro drills a well on the Namibian margin. It's probably a well that Marso should have looked at before they put that together. And what you see is you see rifting, but a passive infill of the sedimentian corrodion over this rift, and only really thin beds of anything that could be associated with the custom shales, and they're inabedded with red beds. So you fail to develop this system south of this Walvis Ridge, or which was set up by that southern outer margin high. And the other thing is, is that on top of the rift sediments itself, we see Aptian Albion oolitic carbonates, which indicate shallow water deposition. And so when we come back to our outer continental high and exhumed mantle picture, remember I've got exhumed mantle juxtaposed to lacustrine source rock, and I've got oceanic crust in that model juxtaposed to salt. So that is supposed to be at two kilometers below water depth, yet I've got, in my opinion, lacustrine salt sediments that are being set, set there. So my view is, is that if you do see exhumed mantle, it's going to be a contraindication for pre-salt play, whereas you're going to want to look for this outer high. Oh, okay, great. Uh, so. My slides obviously aren't colored as I had hoped, but that still works for us. So if we look at a seismic line in the southern Santos Basin, we're going to see the edge of the OCB. It's well defined by the termination of these fracture zones. And what we're going to see in this part of the Santos Basin is that this outer high is underplated, and we can actually see that this outer high is shot full of volcanics. And this is the same line that I just showed you uh, done up in the Petrobras uh, sort of optical stacking. And uh, Zalan in 2012 said that he saw exhumed mantle here at the edge of the uh, Santos Basin. But when you look carefully, what you see is that there's a nice reflector for the base of the oceanic moho that sits right here where his exhumed mantle is. And what I'll show you next is a zoom up of this area on a normal seismic section, albeit without the colors we might have hoped for. We're getting a little more brown and red here. But you see these bright reflectors shot through this outer continental high which are indicative of volcanism, and although it doesn't display well, we see a volcanic addition that sits right here at the edge of this high. So essentially, if we had had exhumed mantle, what I'm saying is, is it's not indicative of where we're going to find a pre-salt play. So I think I'll probably explain this well enough and the concept of having a sequestered basin so I want to just um, move right along and, and kind of complete this diagnostic uh, indications of the pre-salt play. And so as I've said, the pre-salt play occurs in these sequestered lacustrine basins. Uh, the basins are bounded by an outer continental high, and that high sets up the, the basin so we don't get marine influence. And we see a pre-salt stratigraphic and geochemical sequence that's related to this magma pore margin type. And exhumed mantle and SDF are bounded margins. They're going to be high risk for identifying any of kind of a pre-salt play. And importantly, expect variations on this theme. So we can take these ideas and apply them to other areas where we're going to see a mix of indications for this play itself. And so it was easy for me to say, yeah, there's a pre-salt play in Greenland. There's probably no one here knows anything about Greenland. <laughs> so, but 
here in Greenland, it does look like there's a good chance for pre-salt play development, and also possibly in Nova Scotia, where we see the same geometries, salt with a salt ascension zone, or a lock on its tongue, that starts at the edge of this outer continental high. And the real, is there anything we can do about the color on that? The real question is whether or not there's a pre-salt play in the Gulf of Mexico. Right, so I can't talk too much about it. I'll talk again about Greenland. And, and we see that we have some of these sequestered basins with salt. The question is, are we able to really identify underplating? And for that, you need the ion data, which at the time of this uh, writing, all I had was their show line. All right, so here's the Gulf of Mexico. And I apologize for the colors that we don't have. But um, one of the things about the Gulf of Mexico is this is an area around Walker Ridge. And this is where I put the continental basement or outer high. And this is the same high or basement step that my buddy Frank Peel and his colleague uh, Hudek called uh, I think an oceanic step. And again, I thought, well, that's tough because of isostasy. I was always bothered by that. But if I take a courageous interpretation of some seismic data, I can start to see some of the same things that I'm hunting for. Remember, I'm, look, I'm just taking these simple principles and trying to apply them to what I see. And what I see in this area is the potential for an outer high, and I see an allochthonous salt ascension zone that sits at the edge of that continental margin. And then I get oceanic crust outboard of that, right? So that's going to be when that oceanic crust forms around two kilometers. Yeah, it's going to start out, but it's going to subside pretty quickly to that two kilometers of water depth. So the real question is, is there a lacustrine system in the Gulf of Mexico? And there are indications and contraindications. And I say that because if you come over to the Eastern Com, you see a lot of SDRs. I mean, a lot of SDRs. But when I look around in this area, I see some recognizable features for an outer continental high. And one of the other problems is that there's not really a lacustrine oil signature in anything in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's got to be a contraindication, right? Uh, but if you, if you look at the geology of Cuba, where some of the Gulf of Mexico stratigraphy actually outcrops, what you see in this section, you see it's starting at the bottom with red beds and then grading up to nice black shales. I don't know if they're lacustrine or not. And then marine softens. So what I think is Gulf of Mexico is going to have to be a variation on the theme. I don't actually believe we're going to see a classic Brazilian type pre-salt. But there is the potential to have a marine system with sopkas and a marine reservoir or even a lacustrine reservoir that sits below it. But one thing you know is somebody will drill this. And cobalt has been picking up a lot of blocks in this play. So with that, I'd like to give thanks to some of the people that have supported me in this. I gave a paper at uh, Perkins, which this was largely derived from, and Jim Pendell and Norm Rosen uh, kindly let me live through uh, appendicitis and still get my paper in. Uh, Katya Casey, Scott Frazier, and Chrisman Ryman, and Mark Longacre were the part of the team where we developed these ideas, and thanks to these companies for letting me show their data. Thank you. Good. We got good time for questions here. All right, good Dale. Dance. Shoot. Yeah, Frank. Uh, <laughs>
Yeah, I knew this. I knew this was going to be a tough question. I thought I'd get it out of the way first. The, the, the idea of the iceberg floating is, is very good conceptually, but it doesn't really work with the rocks because the rocks have shear strength. So really, some of the structures that you're showing that you're worried that they're not in isostatic equilibrium and that compensate, the crust is just probably strong enough to support those structures. So it's a function of the crustal strength in terms of how thick the thin it might be and the size of the edifice that it's trying to support. So if it's big enough structure, then it will be compensated. That it will root in the upper mantle, but if it's small enough, the structure can support it. So I don't know how big these, these things are that you're talking well, about. Well, the, the outer highs aren't really that big. They're, so they're, they're because it's strong enough to support them. Well, the outer high it is, but when you look at Manischal's interpretation of an exhumed mantle, he's got a very large piece of exhumed mantle sitting down there. And so when I look at it, yeah. I feel that there's a, a disconnect between a, what I see in the stratigraphy and the presence of exhumed mantle. Because then I've got to have that lacustrian system sitting adjacent to uh, all of that Exhumed mantle for a very long time. So when Zalan presented his paper the first time, a couple of two or three APGs ago, I asked him. I said, "So the problem you have is when, Pedro? When are you going to exhume this mantle, and how long is it going to be exhumed as it's juxtaposed to these lacustrine sediments?" Well, I think Manishel thinks every margin has unroofed up unroofed crust. So I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, the problem is that yeah, I don't, I don't, well that's a whole thing we can talk about later. All right. Like I said, I want to get the hard question out first. <laughs> How thick is the uh, sediment between the basement and, and the, uh, the pre-salt? Oh, uh, sure it's, nice Walter, in some places, uh, unfortunately you couldn't see it in the color on the slide, some of these things have three, two, three, five thousand, in the in the big inner rift extensional areas up to five kilometers of sediment so there's a lot of sediment in the kwanzaa basin and that whole section thins as you go outboard below the three salt yeah there's a lot of sediment there it's a lot if you believe the ion depth migration You would um, therefore subscribe to the uh, unzipping sort of stopped at one point or diff differing rates of um, extension or opening of the Atlantic and somehow the wall of this ridge, it uh, sort of paused at that point for a while. Uh, well, so that's a good question actually. Rate of extension. Because, um, yeah, well, let me go back to a slide to talk about that. No, 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 no. let's see. I want... Here we go. So, what I'm saying, right, so the Wabas Ridge sits right here. So, uh, this Burke's original idea was that the Wabas Ridge, this volcanic ridge, prevented the marine transgression of this Aptian Seaway. But actually what's, what's, what happened was the Seaway first tried to go through in this position here. And that mid-Atlantic ridge caused a lot of st structural flexing of this area and set up the South Palo Plateau. And then you get a ridge jump. And then it eventually breaks along this here. And obviously it's not like a stop and go thing. It's going to be going continuously. And so the idea is that while that's breaking up, you still have this outer continental high that's protecting these basins from marine influence. Carl. Good talk, Frank. Um, just a, a comment about the, the thickness of pre-salt strata in the um, there's, there's areas where it's possibly that there's you know five or ten thousand feet of sediment in, in Walker Bay down there. And probably similarly over on the Mexican side of Yucatan. Do you think that's too deep? 
Well, it could well be too deep, right? One of the big problems is, is you may be in a gas setting. And I know, I, I took a look at it, right? There's, there's Madison limestone producing in Wyoming from 24,000 feet. And that was the deepest carbonate reservoir that I was able to find. And so when you start looking at the Gulf of Mexico, over on the eastern side, you don't have that thick, as much sedimentary thickness, but of course over there you get SDRs. So I think the Gulf of Mexico play really still is undefined. And I wanted to bring up the elements that we see in Brazil because when you start beginning to think about something like the Gulf of Mexico, you want to start looking at these pieces of the puzzle. But is it too deep? It, it might be. But is it too deep right close to the edge of salt? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Donna? Great talk. I have a question about the microglots. Would you say they are more similar to one elbow laminates like you see in the uh, San Andreas ramp settings, the current day stromatolites uh, as found in, uh, on the north shores of Australia or closer to the elbow uh, bushes in travertines in the semi-hydrothermal lakes in Italy? So it's a multiple choice question, and it's B and C, right? Because, yeah, the, the sorts of things, you know, I've seen core photos. I can't tell you why or when I saw core photos, but I've seen core photos, and you see both things that would maybe lead you to believe that it has similar characteristics to stromatolites. Not necessarily that you get these nice stromatolite domes, but you get that stromatolytic layering and extensive porosity. And C, yeah, travertines and tufas, when I talked about Pyramid Lake, that would be that kind of characteristic. And so there's an ongoing debate as to whether the microbialites are inorganically deposited or there's still organic mediation a la stromatolites. But there's definitely a difference between Santos and Campos. Because in the Campos Basin, we see these brushy stromatolites, and they're about the size of a hand. And I sat down on those photos and I measured how big are they. And so you just got a series of these stacked brushy stromatolites that eventually form your reservoir. And it looks like in the Campos Basin, lower ductal crust goes further outboard, and so it's possible that they're not getting any hydrothermal fluids that are helping to mediate the stromatolites or the tufas that we see in the Santos Basin. Thank you. Any questions more? Yes. Um, so you talked at length about the uh, geological and geophysical indications and contraindications for setting up these accustomed systems. And in order for um, a petroleum system to be developed, do we also need to think about the paleoclimate? Oh, I'm glad you said that, because it's actually on this slide. I forgot to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, 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 well, we're, we're looking for areas that have an arid climate. Right. Right. And, and the arid climate doesn't necessarily have to mean hot temperatures, just very arid. And we, we see in parts of the Arctic, we have very arid systems, lakes with microbialites. But what we see in Gabon and other places as we go to the north and we have these subtropical environments is that we see that they're clastic dominated. So we don't see these carbonate reservoirs because they're basically polluted out by the clastic influence. So I was thinking of the uh, kind of base of the exploration pyramid where we're looking at uh, source rock uh, distribution and quality. Uh, presumably, we're talking about freshwater shales right. in a freshwater environment. And those tend to require quite a bit of uh, freshwater input from rainfall. Um, if we're looking at things like the East African rift system at the moment, and if you're in a 
truly our environment, is that going to be a contraindication? I think that I, I think that you're you're definitely seeing an air environment light in the system. Maybe there's a change in, in the environment, but I, I don't I don't really put much credence to something that I can't map or interpret on data. So I know that as we go north, we begin to see in the pre-sol evidence of, of classic deposition. Whereas to the south we have a carbonate system that's in a hypersaline alkaline system, which to me fits better with an arid climate than it does with the subtropical climate. And I did look at some of the paleoclimate models, uh, although I didn't put any of that in there, but in other words, the, the model suggested that we were in an arid setting to the south and going subtropical to the north. Whether that's going to be the case in Greenland, that's one of those other things that we need to look at, is, is to try to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Of course, no one's going to drill Greenland for, I'll be dead by the time they decide to drill Greenland, so I'll be safe. <laughs> I'm glad that you mentioned the East African Rift. That's what I was thinking about. If you think a present analog is happening now, uh, where do you think it's tropical? That's one of the requirements and the East African Rift system and the shallow bulb of a mantle that's, we could have that. All these things could be happening in the East African Rift system, right? And other freshwater fresh problems. Right, so in, you, in, the, in Lake Tanganyika and some of these other places, you actually do have stromatolites that occur, go. right? And they've been documented. And then in Ethiopia, in the Danik Hill Graben, where you've got active rifting and volcanism, you see really wild hypersaline alkaline lakes with these microbialites being deposited. So I see the Danik Hill Graben as a closer analog than, say, Lake Tanganyika and the East African rifts. There are also some seismic being shot. I saw some recent pictures. Right. But, probably, I don't know how deep the seismic is. But remember that rifts go through a cycle of fill, right? And so the early rift fill is going to be more like Lake Tanganyika, where you have a deeper lake that's fresh water. And the late fill is going to be more like the Danakil Graben, where it's very shallow and you're seeing hypersaline conditions and these microbialites forming. Yeah. So I'm doing good on the question so far. I feel good. <laughs> I, think good. I think one more. There, there, there is some evidence in Angola from these Contrucci lines where they have went out and acquired data to actually have velocity data. The refraction surveys that were shot uh, with Total and one of the universities in France that escapes me. And on those lines, it looked like that high velocity zone did exist, and that's where the terminology came from. And then there's also some refraction data from the, the northern mid-Atlantic, where it looks like you have some of these zones. Um, but generally, people look to these Contrucci lines for that kind of information. But as a seismic interpreter, I'm looking at basically seismic features, and I'm seeing areas where I've got the moho coming up, and then I've got something that looks like an addition or at the edge of the margin. So that, the whole idea of having this kind of underplating and having this volcanic addition really came out of trying to unravel the seismic interpretation coming up from the moho. And you know, your moho is coming up and the oceanic moho is here and there's something in between. And so that's where I got the, the idea about these additions and then went looking for information and Contrucci in Angola was kind of the source of that. Yeah. Um, oh, damn! <laughs> Wait a minute, you were the first question. <laughs> All right, tell me. So, so, okay, so, 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 
So if, if you have a magma source, right. a plume, then you have to say, and people say that that is underplayed. And if you have an un, uh, a magma poor margin now, where you have where you ungroup the crust, people look at those high velocities and say that that is hydrated predator. Serpentine, right. Serpentinized, right. 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 But, but, but I can say I, I, I have access to a database that has over 15,000 refraction states, and I can tell you that there's high velocity lower crust for you every tectonic promise you can think of. Beneath mountains, beneath oceans, beneath passive margins, beneath uh, <coughs> uh, larger these problems. So I, I, I think that a high velocity lower crust is not really diagnostic of a geologic process. Even though the literature is filled with that, that, that people saying that, I, I, I don't think it's right. Because, like I said, I, you can see high velocity lower crust everywhere on the planet. And it's not like located only beneath passive margins. Or, or whatever. I mean, it's everywhere. And so, if you have a high velocity low crust, that alone, I don't think you can definitely say, well, that's magnetic. Well, what I, what I did is observationally from seismic data look at that. And obviously, Echo Patrol hasn't purchased your data set yet, so we'll have to talk mm -hmm. to them about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, with that. And with that, let's just yeah. skedaddle. Thanks a lot. For <laughs>geological society presenting uh, this nice uh, petrified wood I think it doesn't say where it's from but I think it's yeah it doesn't say all right well, Th thank thanks you. a lot thanks everybody